what lessons were learned? The Cambodian issue was one of the early tests as a country and as a foreign service. Our efforts over the 10 odd years were important for both our foreign policy as well as the foreign ministry as a whole. In that time, our foreign policy matured and grew in strength. I would suggest that five lessons were learned. First and foremost, we hoisted in the importance of being independent and self-reliant. We have to depend on ourselves to protect our national interests. We developed an independent foreign policy. We showed the world that in spite of our size, we were prepared to defend our interests even if we were up against major powers like the US and China. We also taught ourselves to be self-reliant and gain confidence in our ability to stick to our guns even when no one else would support us. Second, the decade-long campaign also made us realize the necessity of being nimble and pragmatic. We have to be alert to what is happening around us. We had to work within ASEAN, with the major powers and at multilateral settings like NAM and the UN, both with our friends and like other countries, as well as with our opponents. Geopolitics is, by definition, never static or ever and ever evolving. We had little choice but to pick up on the changing positions of the various players quickly and react accordingly. While Vietnam had perhaps underestimated ASEAN at the start of the conflict, there was no way to tell that by 1991, the world would have changed so dramatically with its with strongest backer, the Soviet Union, crumbling after the fall of the Berlin Wall. This was a significant external factor that provided us with an inlet to pressure Vietnam into brokering a deal and indeed led to the success of the second Paris Conference where the first in 1989 had failed. ASEAN's role was to keep the issue alive until the global constellation of forces shifted in the direction that would make a negotiated settlement possible. Another important aspect of being pragmatic is to know when to step back and play a supporting role. The Cambodian issue was essentially a Sino-Soviet proxy conflict. This was clearly beyond the powers of Singapore or even ASEAN as a whole to resolve. What ASEAN could do then was to prevent a fair company so that when the constellation of powers, major powers shifted, a diplomatic solution would still be possible. Thus, when the permanent five members of the UN Security Council decided to get directly involved in the Cambodian issue in 1990, we stepped back. Since the issue had already gained traction internationally, there was no need for us to be heavily involved, and indeed, even if we wanted to, the big boys would have ultimately called the shots and settled it. The alliance of convenience between the US and China could not in itself have held the line. The tenure of the times in the late 1970s throughout the 1980s was such that if ASEAN had not taken the lead to argue the point of principle, the tide of international opinion at the UN and other international organizations would certainly have turned against the US and China, particularly in view of the odious Khmer Rouge regime. Southeast Asia would today be a different place if the invasion of Cambodia had been allowed to undermine the fundamental principles that are the foundations of regional peace and stability. In an intrinsically diverse region like ours, a neighbor's internal arrangements, however odious, cannot be the pretext for armed conflict. Third, the process of working closely with our friends and neighbors give us all a better understanding of the respective foreign policies and modus operandi of ASEAN members. When we and our ASEAN colleagues embarked on our series of initiatives against the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia, we had little inkling of how long this would take or what exactly we would need to do along the way. By virtue of our geographic location, it is imperative to try to have a good relations with all our neighbours. The Cambodian issue provided opportunities for us to cement these relations. In fact, 
many ASEAN delegates knew one another at a personal level and even played golf together. The wives of the respective ASEAN delegates also prepared food and visited one another during the festive seasons. When a decision has to be made, it was not uncommon for a Singaporean official to discuss it with his ASEAN counterpart over the telephone. The first 10 years of ASEAN's existence had all been about confidence building and the Cambodian issue really drew everyone closer together. These personal links helped smoothen the way forward. Fourth, we developed a better feel and gained insights as to how multilateral organizations function. We started to understand the strengths, potentials and limits. We had always intellectually understood that the UN, for instance, could amplify the voices of and create space for small countries like Singapore. We learned firsthand how to accomplish this during the Cambodian conflict and years later when Singapore was a member of the Security Council. We recognize that UN has a unique and legitimate role which should remain central in international diplomacy. And fifth, the Cambodian issue also taught us the importance of continually developing and honing an excellent foreign service. By the 1980s, we were perhaps no longer what the late Professor Michael Liffer labelled us, a collection of information gatherers and messenger boys. But we were still learning on the job and trying to apply our practical experience of diplomacy. After independence in 1965, the government had assembled a foreign service from scratch by leveraging on talent from a variety of sectors, for example, including eminent people like the, foreign, the former president, Mr. Asar Nadan, and Professor S. Kuma. And it was only after 14 years that a small group of professional foreign service officers were emerging. It was through years of working on the issue that this group of officers perfected their trade craft. The same group later leveraged on the experience, exposure, and clarity of Singapore's interest to operate with relative independence. Many of our foreign service officers cut their teeth and learned their trade during the period, some of whom are still serving career ambassadors and senior officials today. Unfortunately, this group of talented officers will not be around forever. To ensure that Singapore is well protected, we need to constantly cultivate and reveal teams with these qualities. The ability to stay focused on Singapore's interests and objectives, think on the feet, speak off the cuff, communicate effectively, and persevere against all odds. As time passes, the memories and experience of the Cambodian diplomatic campaign will fade, and the next generation of officials and diplomats will have no equivalent first-hand experience of a similar struggle, diplomatic struggle, on such a critical issue. While nothing beats the hands-on experience to teach vital skills, which must become internalized and instinctive among young officers, what we can do now is to tell stories and train them as best as we can. This is not to say that diplomacy today, the nature of diplomacy today, is the same as that in the 1980s. There have been significant changes in the world, with technology, the internet and social media changing both the people, the way people connect and communicate with one another and the way diplomacy is being conducted. Foreign service officers today must adapt to and embrace these new developments while continuing to balance complex and diverse interests, handle crisis and be willing to take risks. But a core purpose of diplomacy, to promote and protect Singapore's national interests, remains the same. And the many of the fundamental skills of effective diplomacy are as relevant today as they were 20, 30 years ago. New generations of talented foreign service officers we need to continue to ensure that Singapore's foreign policy agenda is upheld in advance. The Foreign Service must have its fair share of talent for it to be effective. 